Like others, our last guest is an all-rounder, actor, comedian, Emmy Award-winning writer, filmmaker. He is ranked number 98 on Comedy Central's 100 Greatest Stand-Ups of All Time. <laughs> but what the fuck do they know? For us, he's number one tonight, Louis C.K. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm really honored to be here. I'm, I'm happy just to be here to, as a ticket holder, just to watch everything that's happened. Uh, the Stiller family, and uh, uh, that was crazy, and Kevin, and uh, the uh, guy that looks like Dick Cheney at the end there. Uh, a very, <laughs> very nice version of Dick Cheney. Uh, he's not a lizard, I don't think, but... Um, uh, I, I, I think I can just tell you what George is... Uh, I'm a comedian, and I do what, what he did. And uh, uh, he was the first person I knew that I, that I knew what comedy was. Uh, children love to laugh, but most people that make children laugh for a living suck at it. Uh, clowns aren't funny. That doesn't exist, a funny clown. If a person was funny, they'd do comedy because you make money doing it. No clowns. There's no HBO clown specials if you make a bunch of money. So clowns suck. And kids just look at them and just go, just please stop trying to make me laugh. There's nothing worse than a person who's not funny trying to be funny, and that's what a clown is. A guy waiting for a bus is funnier than a shit clown at a kid's party. So, But kids need to laugh, so the first time you really laugh means a lot to you. And I remember my first big, like, grown-up feeling laugh, and I saw George Carlin on Saturday Night Live, and he said, um, he said what do dogs do on their day off? Uh, they can't lay around, that's their job. And I just, something went off, and I just couldn't stop laughing. And, and I, I, the idea was born in my head at that moment. I want to be funny. I want to be a comedian. I didn't know that a grown person could be a comedian. That's an incredible thing to me. And I had other heroes, Richard Pryor, Steve Martin, uh, Bill Cosby, but George was like me. He was an East Coast a Catholic, uh, you know. I had something to identify with him. And the first time I remember getting a laugh, I was... Um, in fourth grade, and they asked the class, um, they, the teacher said, there are three bones in the skull. What, name one. And I said, the noggin. And uh, I got a big laugh. And I thought, hey, you know, I could do this. I could be like George. So I, got, I started doing, right out of high school, I started doing stand-up. Didn't go to college, didn't pursue anything else professionally, really started doing stand-up. First time I went on stage, I did a minute and a half, and I bombed. It was terrible. But I wanted it so badly that I kept trying, and I learned how to write jokes. And I just had jokes, kind of funny thoughts. And I, about, I don't know, 15 years later, I, <laughs> I had been going in a circle that didn't take me anywhere. Nobody gave a shit who I was, and I didn't either. I honestly didn't. I used to hear my acting and go, this is shit, and I hate it. But I've been doing this for 15 years, and stopping now is like getting out of prison. Like, what do you do after 15 years of stand-up comedy? How do you re-enter the workforce? So I was in a really bad place. I hated my act. I've been doing the same hour of comedy for 15 years, and it was shit, I promise you. And I was working places like Chinese restaurants. And this is, this is I was. I'd do a show in a Chinese restaurant where... They don't even know there's a show going to happen. They're there to eat. And all of a sudden you'd go, hey, everybody. And people are like, I'm eating. I don't want to be forced to sit in this. Uh. So I was doing a, re a Chinese restaurant called the Kowloon in Boston, in Saug Saugus, Massachusetts. And I was sitting in my car after the show just feeling like, I'd, <laughs> this, is, this was all a big mistake. I'm not good enough. And I hate, I, was, I felt like my jokes were a trap. And... I listened to a CD of George um, talking about comedy and uh, the workshopping it and talking about it seriously. And the thing that blew me away about this fellow was that he just kept putting out specials. Every year there'd be a new George Carlin special, a new George Carlin album. They just kept coming. And each one was deeper than the next. And I just thought, how can he do that? And it, it made me literally cry <laughs> that I could never do that. I was telling the same jokes for 15 years. So... I'm listening, and they ask him, um, how'd you, how'd you, how do you do all this material? And I'm like, eh. And I, 
And I hear him and he says, well, I just decided every year I'd be working on that year's special. And I'd do the special and then I'd just chuck out the material and I'd start again with nothing. And I thought, that's crazy. How do you throw away? It took me 15 years to build this shitty hour. <laughs> if I throw it away, I got nothing. But I, he gave me this, the courage to try. And also, I was desperate. What the fuck else was I going to do? <laughs> this idea that you throw everything away and you start over again. And I thought, well, okay, when you're done telling jokes about airplanes and dogs, and you throw those away, what do you got left? You can only dig deeper. Start talking about your, you know, your feelings and who you are. And then you do those jokes and they're gone. You got to dig deeper. So then you start thinking about your fears and your nightmares and doing jokes about that. And then they're gone. And then you start going into just weird shit. Yeah, eventually you get to your balls. But there's a whole... <laughs> it's a process that I watched him do my whole life and I started to try to do it. And I started to think, what do I... Because he says whatever he wants. What do I really want to say that I'm afraid to say? And at the time I was a father. I am still a father. <laughs> but at the time... I had started, I didn't take off yet. The jury's out. My oldest is eight. I could still split. So far, I'm still there. Um, I was having a lot of hard, a hard time being a father. And I wanted to say it on stage. And one night, I just, I thought, okay, I'm, forget all the old jokes. I'm going to start again. And I thought of the first thing. I said, I can't have sex with my, do with my daughter, with my wife, <laughs> because we have a baby. And our baby's a fucking asshole. It's just what I was feeling, and I said it. And the audience went, whoa! And I thought, oh, I'm somewhere new now. And I said... <laughs> and I said uh, something like, I never used to get babies in the garbage, but now I understand it. And they did that. And I thought, I'd rather have that than the shit tepid laughter for my 15-year-old jokes. So I started going down this road. And I, he was always the beacon for me, always, this guy. Um, he always gave me the courage. He says, you know, the, the, the line that Kevin quoted, where he said people that abortion rallies are usually, anti-abortion rallies are people who wanna, wouldn't want to fuck in the first place. He, that he opened a special with that at Carnegie Hall. <laughs> he, he comes out on stage, you have to watch it, and he doesn't, he doesn't milk the crowd for applause. He's just, they're applauding, and he goes, they're all going, George, George. And he goes, yeah, 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 yeah. I got to get this out. You ever notice the people, <laughs> anti-abortion rallies, or people who want to want fuck in the first place? He, and, and most comedians would do, like, you know, a good half an hour of really sweet material and couch that joke in a lot of... But he just had to get it out there. So he set that example for me, and that's the way I've done... Uh, my act and, and and since then I've done three comedy specials and I've started down the same road It's been a, a massive change for me. I feel uh, every year. I've got something to work for the same I'm doing exactly what he taught uh, me to do and on stage I feel the a courage to say what I want to say because because of this guy and um, Anyway a few years ago. Um, I was about to tape my first my my second stand-up special and he was taping the same night um, in LA. He taped his last special on the same night that I taped one. And I remember feeling like, this is amazing that I do what this great man does. And that we do it in the same way. And he um, died and he kicked me in the balls when he died. It really hurt. And then I remember that, and I, I don't want to be doing this, I'm sorry. But uh, <laughs> later I was at a whatever, it doesn't matter. And my phone rang, and it was his, it was his daughter, it was Kelly. And uh, I have two kids, and they're girls. So I thought, he's got a daughter, and her, his daughter is calling me. And I know what it means to have a daughter, because I have two. And she's calling me and asking me to come and, and say something about what he meant to me. So that, that was a, a big moment for me. I'm very proud to do what George did. I'm so, I know I was supposed to close funny, but I just, I'm not good at doing the stuff that isn't my act, so I'm sorry. Uh, but he was a great man, and, and anything that I, ever happens to me that's good is due to this guy. And, uh, and I can tell you, because I do what he did, that it was really hard to say the shit that he did, and that it took a lot of courage. It was difficult. Uh, so uh, thanks for coming and honoring him, and thanks for having me. Yeah.